Thank you, and welcome back <clears throat> from our break. <clears throat> um, we're going to uh, start out with mumps in this session and then meningococcal vaccines, and then we're going to slip in anthrax from yesterday, just so everybody knows what's uh, planned. And so we'll start with mumps with Dr. Moore. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce the, uh, the discussions around mumps from the mumps work group. So first, a review of our terms of reference. Our objective for this work group is to evaluate and propose policy options to prevent or control mumps outbreaks in the United States. And our activities are focused on the optimal use of the current MMR vaccine. We're reviewing the epidemiology of mumps in the two-dose vaccine era reviewing available evidence on the duration of immunity for mumps after two doses of MMR and other risk factors for vaccine failure, as well as reviewing available evidence on any impact a third dose of MMR may have on outbreak control. And finally, we'll be looking at programmatic implications and cost of various policy options for a third dose of MMR for outbreak control. Our group has been quite busy over the last few months. We've had biweekly conference calls and uh, we have conducted one brief online survey to get feedback from members of the working group. And our, our focus in the past few months has been really a focus on the reviewing of the literature and unpublished data. As you can see, this long list of topics here includes all of the available information on mumps epidemiology, the laboratory data related to the vaccine and the virus, both looking at two-dose vaccine information as well as available information on three-dose vaccines, including clinical studies that have been done looking at a third dose for mumps outbreak control and safety of the third dose. And finally, we appreciated learning more about the U.S. military experience with mumps disease and vaccination. This is our timeline. We're now up to June. And today we're going to be talking with you about an update on mumps epidemiology in the U.S. so far this year, as well as a summary of all of that evidence that we've reviewed in recent months. In October, we plan to summarize the evidence reviewed by the work group and begin to prevent, present work group interpretation of that evidence with the hope that by February we can present additional information from studies that are going on right now, particularly related to the cost of various policy options. And at that time, uh, we anticipate a possible ACIP vote. I'd like to acknowledge the active participation of our MUMPS work group members, most especially Mona Marin, who's been our CDC lead. Um, she's worked tirelessly to pull together a huge amount of information for us to digest. So today's session will include Dr. Marin doing an update of MUMPS epidemiology and our evidence, and then Dr. Christina Cardamil will look at the effectiveness of the third dose of MMR vaccine in a MUMPS outbreak in a highly vaccinated university population in Iowa in 2015 and 16. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Marin. Good morning, everyone. So in today's presentation, I will provide an update on mumps epidemiology in the United States in 2017 and present the evidence reviewed by the work group concerning immune response to the third dose of measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, or MMR, referred to hereafter as MMR3, published studies on the use of MMR3 for mumps outbreak control and safety of MMR3. Along with the next presentation, the information presented today covers the evidence currently available on the use of MMR3. As Dr. Moore mentioned, the work group deliberations and interpretation of the evidence on use of MMR3 are ongoing and will be presented during the October meeting. This figure presented at the February meeting shows the reported mumps cases in the United States during the vaccine era. Overall, since vaccine program introduction, reported mumps cases declined by approximately 99%. 
However, several large MAMS outbreaks have been reported from 2006 through 2016, resulting in increased number of cases in certain years, as shown in the inset. Examining more closely the most recent six years, since 2011, there has been an increasing trend in cases and outbreaks, as reflected by these epidemiologic characteristics. Case count, incidence, number of outbreak cases, proportion of outbreak-related cases among all reported cases, and number of jurisdictions reporting outbreak cases. With 2016 having not only the highest number of cases and jurisdictions with outbreaks reported within the past six years, but also within the past decade. The graph illustrates the number of cases, the bars, and the incidence, the line, for 2011-2016. If we compare 2017 with 2016, preliminary data through the end of May suggests that 2017 appears slated towards the trend seen in 2016 for the same characteristics. In 2017, the case count is already at 3,300, half the number of cases reported in 2016. Incidence is lower than in 2016, but higher than in any other year before 2016. Outbreak cases represent two-thirds of all cases, and the number of jurisdictions with outbreak cases is the same as in 2016. It is important to note that a large mumps outbreak with more than 3,500 cases in Arkansas primarily among the Marshallese population, a close-knit community in northwest Arkansas, accounted for about 2,400 of the cases reported in 2016 and approximately 500 of the cases reported in 2017. In the graph, the cases in the Marshallese community in Arkansas are indicated by the hatched bars. So even if the cases from this large outbreak were excluded, 2016 still continues to have the highest number of cases and incidents compared to previous years, and 2017 has a similar trend. The dotted line represents the incidents without the Arkansas cases included. In 2017, the highest incidence continues to be in the 18 to 22 age group, similarly to previous years, as shown by the hatched bars. The median age of patients with mums is 23 years, and 73% of those with no number of doses have two or more doses of MMR. To date, in 2017, CDC is aware of at least 40 outbreaks, with half, 19, occurring in university settings, and one-third, 14, community-wide, of which nine in close-knit communities, eight of them in Marshallese communities, which spread from the Arkansas outbreak. Other close-contact settings also experienced outbreaks in 2017, including a military facility. Several factors have been hypothesized to contribute to the increasing number of mumps outbreaks. As discussed during the last ACIP meeting, the vaccine effectiveness for two doses is estimated to be 88%, and therefore cases can still occur among vaccinated persons. Second, Waning of vaccine-induced immunity, especially in the era of low disease incidence and absence of boosting from wild disease, has been demonstrated. Serologic evidence have shown neutralizing antibody titers decline over time. However, there are no established correlates of protection. Therefore, the implication of declining titers remain uncertain. Epidemiologic evidence also suggests waning, with decreased vaccine effectiveness and increased odds of contracted disease with time since vaccination, but evidence is still limited. Waning of immunity, however, does not explain the typically focal nature of outbreaks. 
increased force of infection from intense exposure settings, such as college campuses or close-knit communities, where there is high population density and contact rates that facilitate transmission, is frequently postulated as a risk factor for the current mumps outbreaks. Concern was also raised that antigenic differences between the circulating and vaccine strains may lead to mumps vaccine-induced immunity being less effective against other strains. To date, studies showed that all sera from vaccinated children neutralized diverse mumps strains. However, the antibody levels against non-vaccine strains are lower than the levels against the vaccine strain, and these differences may become more important over time. And lastly, we acknowledge the uncertainty and that there may be other factors not identified or measured. Because waning of immunity after two doses of MMR is one of the hypotheses considered to explain the current mumps epidemiology, there is increased interest regarding the effect of a third dose of MMR. Today, I will summarize the evidence related to MMR3 reviewed by the work group, and I will start with the laboratory evidence which describes the antibody response to MMR3. Most of the available evidence on antibody response after MMR3 comes from a study that included a cohort of 656 young adults who received care at the Marshfield Clinic, a large HMO in rural Wisconsin. The median age at MMR3 was 21 years, and the mean years since the second dose of MMR, or MMR2, was 15. This study examined geometric mean titers for neutralizing antibody against the Jerry Lynn vaccine virus and the proportion of participants with seronegative or with low titers pre-MMR3 considered baseline at one month and one year after MMR3. Compared with baseline, geometric mean titers were significantly higher albeit modestly, at one month and one year after MMR3. However, only 6% of subjects had a fourfold rise or more from baseline to one month after MMR3, and 2% had a fourfold rise or more from baseline to one year. At baseline, very few subjects had low or negative titers, 7%, and one year after MMR3, this proportion declined to 3%. This slide shows the reverse cumulative distribution curves for neutralizing mumps antibody titers at baseline, one month, the red line, and one year after MMR3, the green line in the middle. As can be seen from the graphs, the shape of the curves at all three time points was similar, indicating that the shift in antibody titers was minimal. One other observation from this study was that post-vaccination titers were highly correlated with baseline titers, meaning that subjects with lower baseline titers were more likely to have lower titers at one month and one year after MMR3, whereas subjects with higher baseline titers were more likely to have higher titers at one month and one year. In the graphs, circles represent individual titer levels. These results presented in the graphs were obtained when testing for whole virus neutralizing antibodies but nearly identical findings were observed when antibodies to mumps-specific proteins were studied. And these results are included in the backup slides. Altogether, these findings may indicate an inherent trajectory for mumps titer, or a set point for individual antibody levels that is minimally affected by MMR3. <coughs> In a much smaller study of 17 subjects aged 19 to 30 years who were seronegative for mumps despite two documented doses of MMR and received MMR3, 
all but one subject, 91%, developed an IgG response when tested two to three months after MMR3. The response was rapid, observed at seven to 10 days, indicating an anamnestic response with peak antibody activity present sometime between testing at seven to 10 days and two to three months later. But antibody kinetics two to three months after MMR3 were not evaluated. To date, the laboratory evidence on MMR3 use remains limited. In addition to the lack of a correlate of protection against which to assess the changes in antibody titers, the qualitative aspects of the immune response, such as antibody avidity or B cell memory, or the strain specific immune response after MMR3, have not been assessed. Next, I will discuss the epidemiologic evidence related to the impact of MMR3 for mumps outbreak control. I would like to mention that the work group is aware and heard presentations about outbreaks in which MMR3 was not administered and only standard outbreak control measures were implemented for outbreak control. All of these data will be considered as part of work group's deliberations for use of MMR3 and will be presented in October. Today's session is on the evidence related to impact on MMR3 use. Although several states have implemented MMR3 vaccination campaigns to control mumps outbreaks, there are only three studies that formally assess the impact of MMR3 for outbreak control. Two were school-based, which I will summarize next, and one was conducted in an university setting, which will be described by Dr. Cardemil in the next presentation. Three dose intervention campaigns were conducted in Orange County, New York, where 81% of eligible students aged 11 to 17 years were vaccinated with MMR3, and in Guam, where 33% of eligible students aged 9 to 14 years received MMR3. In both studies, attack rates were lower among MMR3 recipients than among MMR2 recipients. However, the results were not statistically significantly different. The small number of cases post-MMR3 intervention limited the power of the studies to detect a difference if one truly existed. In the Orange County study, the incremental vaccine effectiveness of MMR3 was calculated as 88%, although had a large confidence interval that included zero. Additionally, in Orange County, the attack rates fell post-intervention among all age groups in the community, with the highest and significant decline among the age group targeted by vaccination in the schools, 11 to 17, followed by 5 to 10-year-olds, the other age group that attended the same school, schools as vaccinated children. As indicated by the two epi curves, attack rates declined after MMR3 in both school-based studies, but also the third dose intervention occurred after the peak of the outbreaks, and the possibility of the declines being unrelated to the intervention could not be excluded. Details on attack rates and number of cases in these studies are included in the backup slides. And lastly, I will review the safety evidence of MMR3. The safety data on MMR3 were collected as part of the same Marshfield cohort that was used to assess immune response to MMR3. A total of 662 young adults with a median age of 21 years who received MMR3 completed safety diaries. Data on 14 solicited symptoms were collected two weeks before and four weeks after MMR3. Significantly higher rates of adverse events after MMR3 was demonstrated for four symptoms, headache, joint pain, diarrhea, and swollen glands. Overall, the proportion of subjects who reported these symptoms was low and the duration of symptoms was short, as seen from the table. No serious adverse events require, requiring medical attention occurred. 
Therefore, it seems that MMR3 appears safe and well tolerated in a young adult population. And I will conclude with some knowledge gaps and several planned and ongoing studies to inform third dose deliberations. Cost of public health response to contain a mumps outbreak in an university setting that included an MMR3 intervention at the University of Iowa, but we are actively pursuing other settings. Cost of various um, policy, cost effectiveness analysis of various policy options for MMR3 to prevent or control mumps outbreak. Model the impact of MMR3 on burden of mumps during a mumps outbreak. Genotype G strain specific immune response to MMR3 and to MMR2, to MMR2 more than 10 years since the second dose. And a data call coordinated by CDC to obtain more complete national data from states on epidemiology of and response to mumps outbreak. And we are also seeking input from ACIP on additional data, um, third dose or in general, to present that would be useful to inform the deliberations. Thank you. Um, I have to acknowledge my colleagues <laughs> who helped a lot. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, maybe we'll have a few questions right now for Dr. Marin. Are there questions? Okay, I guess not. I think we'll go on to Dr. Cardamil. I will be presenting our investigation into the effectiveness of a third dose of MMR used during a mumps outbreak in a highly vaccinated student population in Iowa. In 2015, a mumps outbreak was reported from Johnson County, Iowa. Most cases were in the University of Iowa, a setting with over 22,000 undergraduates and a two-dose MMR requirement since 2012 with provider verified doses uploaded to their electronic database. Health officials decided to implement a widespread third dose campaign in the university, making this outbreak a good opportunity to evaluate the effectiveness of the third dose. There were 453 mumps cases reported during the outbreak, with 300 of these confirmed. The vaccination campaign was held in eight clinics over six days from November 10th through 19th, 2015, and was university-wide. Vaccine was offered free of charge to students under the age of 25, during the daytime and evening hours, and at centralized locations. Most cases in the county, about two-thirds, were in the University of Iowa students. The primary objective of this study was to estimate the vaccine effectiveness of three versus two doses of MMR against mumps. Secondary objectives included assessing for waning immunity as well as estimating the VE of two versus zero doses. Case status was determined from the outbreak investigation, which was conducted as a separate investigation in parallel to this analysis, based on the CST case definition that included probable and confirmed mumps cases. We define the outbreak period as starting on the first date of the academic fall semester and ending on the last date of the spring semester. We merged university vaccination records with student registration records, which included student de demographic information. And vaccine records were verified, as mentioned earlier, by a medically trained provider who uploaded valid doses to the electronic database. We verified a subset of vaccine dates manually, including for students who did not have two MMR doses on file, for closely spaced vaccines, and for implausible dates. We also reviewed exemption status, if applicable. Students were included in the analysis if they were age eligible for the MMR vaccination campaign and enrolled in the entire 2015-16 academic year. Students with positive titers or vaccination records that were not required by the university were excluded from analysis. We used Fisher's exact test to compare unadjusted attack rates and developed multivariable Cox proportional hazards models to determine risk-adjusted VE. We examined the variables listed here by case and vaccination status. 
For the primary analysis of three versus two doses, we limited the data set to students who had received two doses by the start of the outbreak period. A subset of these students received a third dose during the outbreak. Incremental VE was defined as the additional reduction in mumps disease experienced by three-dose recipients compared to two-dose recipients. The third dose receipt was treated as a time-varying covariate, and we utilized four models, each with a different post-vaccination time frame based on the expected immune response at 7, 14, 21, and 28 days post-vaccination. And this will be examined a little bit further in the next few slides. To evaluate the VE of two versus zero doses, we created a separate model with a shorter time frame for analysis from the start of the outbreak period to just prior to the date of the first campaign to avoid the influence of any change in exposure and risk during and after the campaign. Relative risk was estimated using the hazard ratio and VE was calculated as one minus the relative risk times 100. So I will briefly describe the time varying covariate used in this analysis. Students who were analyzed entered the outbreak period with two doses. Four distinct possibilities existed during the analysis period and the first is shown here. If the student did not develop mumps or receive a third dose, their person time continued until the end of the outbreak period. In the second scenario, a student enters the outbreak period with two doses, develops mump symptoms, and their person time ends. In the third scenario, a student enters with two doses, receives a third dose, and after the specified time period post-vaccination, continues their person time in the analysis as a third dose recipient. The final scenario is similar to the previous, but a three dose recipient develops mumps symptoms, and so their person time ends before the end of the outbreak period. We developed four models to specify the start of immunological protection beginning at 7, 14, 21, or 28 days post-vaccination. Previous studies used 21 days to cover the average mumps incubation period of 16 to 18 days. However, the range for the incubation period is up to 25 days, and it may take a few weeks to develop an immune response post-vaccination. We also wanted to examine a slightly shorter period of time to allow for a more rapid anamnestic response. We'll first present results on the age distribution of the first, second, and third MMR doses examined years since MMR2 administration and coverage before versus after the outbreak. We will then look at attack rates followed by the multivariable regression model that includes examination of waning immunity, and then end the presentation of results by examining the VE estimates of three versus two and two versus zero doses. Of those who received a first dose of MMR, 83% were administered at 12 to 23 months of age. Of those who received a second dose of MMR, 82% were administered at four to six years of age, aligning with ACIP recommendations at the time of administration. A second wave of administrations for the first and the second dose are seen in the university age group, close to when the majority of the third doses were administered. This figure shows years since the second dose of MMR by age at time of administration. The distribution of the variable year since receipt of MMR2 was clustered in two periods, administration at four to six years of age and just prior to and during uh, university enrollment at 17 to 24 years of age with a few students falling outside of the bimodal distribution. We examine this variable year since receipt of the second dose as a continuous variable, a dichotomous variable, less than 13 years and 13 years or more since receipt of the second dose, as well as a four level categorical variable. Regardless of the variable type used in the model, the result was statistically significant for the primary analysis. And because the data are not linear yet, we will see in subsequent slides that there is an increase in risk of disease with years since second dose administration. We report results using the categorical variable in order to demonstrate this stepwise increase in risk. For the two versus zero doses analysis, because of the smaller sample size of the zero dose group, the four level stratification was not possible and we report results using the dichotomous variable. Prior to the outbreak, 98.1% of students had two or more MMR doses and 2% had three or more doses. At the end of the outbreak, 99.5% of students had two or more doses and 25.3% had three or more doses. 
The attack rate is inversely proportional to the number of MMR doses received, with the highest attack rate in the unvaccinated. The overall attack rate for comparison was 12.6 per 1,000 population. More distant receipt of MMR2 was associated with a higher attack rate. And both of these trends and attack rates were statistically significant. At the start of the outbreak, 19,705 students had two doses. Of these, 4,778 students, or 24%, received a third dose. Of the third doses that were administered during the outbreak period, 94% of those were administered during the fall campaign. In this model, which includes a post-vaccination timeframe of 28 days, students who received the third MMR dose had a hazard ratio of 0.22. In other words, receipt of the third dose was associated with a lower incidence of mumps disease as compared to two-dose recipients. More distant receipt of MMR2, 13 to 24 years prior to the outbreak, was associated with a higher risk of being a case. That is, students who received the second dose 13 or more years prior to the outbreak had a 9 to 14-fold increased risk of being a case as compared to students who received the second dose more recently. The incremental VE of the third versus the second MMR dose ranged from 60.2% at 7 days post-vaccination up to 78.2% at 28 days post-vaccination. Our finding of an incremental VE of 60.2% at seven days post-vaccination suggests that there is benefit shortly after the campaign due to the anamnestic immune response. However, given the long incubation period for mumps and the time needed to develop an immune response, an incremental VE of 78% at 28 days post-vaccination might be a better representation of the full effect of the third dose. The one prior published study that was mentioned by Dr. Marin reported an incremental VE of the third dose uh, of a point estimate of 88%, but had wide confidence intervals that crossed zero, and they used a 21-day post-vaccination window. The probability of remaining mumps-free was higher with receipt of the third MMR dose for all four post-vaccination timeframes examined. All models shown here control for years since the second MMR dose, and 95% confidence bands are shown. The VE of two versus zero MMR doses differed by a year since the second dose. VE was 89.4% for students who received the second dose less than 13 years prior to the outbreak, and 31.8% for students who received the second dose 13 or more years prior to the outbreak. These estimates both had wide confidence intervals, particularly the past estimate, but when compared head to head, the difference between these two estimates was statistically significant. There are limitations to this investigation. Perhaps most importantly, this was an observational study with possible unmeasured factors that could have led to over or underestimation of VE. For example, it's possible that there was differential receipt of the third dose based on risk. There were anecdotal reports that some students sought receipt of the MMR vaccine after a friend or roommate was diagnosed with mumps or were urged by a parent to obtain the vaccine. If third dose recipients were more frequently exposed to mumps than students who did not receive the third dose, our estimates of the incremental VE of the third dose would be underestimated. To address the possibility of other unmeasured factors affecting VE, such as differential intensity among different ages, we conducted sensitivity analyses with time since MMR2, examined as a continuous and dichotomous variable, and in a narrow age group. The effect of time since the second dose was maintained in these analyses. A second limitation is that because the immunization status during the outbreak period was dynamic and the student population was highly vaccinated with a small number of zero-dose students, the two versus zero doses estimates had very wide confidence intervals. We chose not to exclude any zero-dosers from the two versus zero VE estimates even though a large proportion of them had received one or two doses during the outbreak period. And we were unable to control for the receipt of any outbreak dose in this group because the standard error for the covariate was very large, making the regression model unstable. However, even without this covariate, the estimates were very similar, giving us confidence that, if anything, these estimates are more conservative and that VE could be underestimated. 
There are three main take home points from this investigation. First, in this highly vaccinated university setting, the vast majority of students had two or more MMR doses. However, this was not sufficient to prevent an outbreak in this close contact setting. Second, the third dose of MMR that was administered as part of the university-wide campaign was free of charge, was given free of charge to all age eligible students and was associated with a significantly decreased incidence of bumps. And the magnitude of that reduction is shown in the incremental BE estimate, which ranged from 60 to 78%. Third, waning immunity likely played a role in this outbreak propagation. And our investigation revealed three pieces of evidence to support this. Cases were more likely to receive the second dose 13 or more years prior to the outbreak. Attack rates correlated significantly with time since the second dose, and the VE of two versus zero doses was lower with more distant receipt of the second dose. There are some considerations worth mentioning in the interpretation of the findings from this investigation. First, approximately one in four targeted students received the third dose. While at first this might appear to be a small proportion, it is within the range of previous additional dose interventions in similar settings, where anywhere from 16 to 81% of the target population was reached. Second, a campaign of this magnitude is no small achievement, and it's really no secret that it can be very time and resource intensive, and while feasible in some settings, might not be possible in others. And third, it is likely that other factors contributed to outbreak control, other than the use of the third dose. Iowa is no stranger to mumps, having lived through the 2006 resurgence. And this was a very highly organized outbreak response with very strong participation and frequent communication between the public health officials at the state, local, and university levels. The Student Health Center, fairly early in the outbreak, determined the need for standardized protocols for case identification, testing, and isolation recommendations. And the student body was made aware of the outbreak by university officials through various mod modalities, and results from the outbreak investigation indicated very high self-reported adherence to isolation recommendations. And finally, perhaps most importantly, we cannot forget the pre-existing two-dose MMR requirement for next semester's registration, without which this outbreak could have been much larger. I would like to acknowledge the work of the many contributors to this evaluation. This truly was a collaborative effort with excellent teamwork from the university and the health departments. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very nice presentation of a very good study. Um, Shall we take questions now for both uh, Dr. Cardamil and Dr. Marin? Ms. Pellegrini. Thank you. My question's for Dr. Cardamil. Could you go back to slide three, which shows the mumps cases in Johnson County? Thank you, perfect. Um, so it looks like the vaccination campaign happened in November. And I'm not sure how to read the slide to, to sh where, where would CDC consider the peak of the outbreak to have occurred. So this outbreak slide um, is barred from the NICE outbreak investigation that was conducted in parallel. And so it includes all of the cases in the county. So the university cases uh, from the student body population that were analyzed in this particular study are shown in blue. But it also includes cases in the community, which are shown in red, and the cases in uh, Iowa, University of Iowa faculty and staff shown in in the green. And so the peak, um, you could say that there were several peaks throughout this outbreak. Um, but in terms of the highest peak, uh, we're referring to the one that has the highest number of cases, both for the university students as well as the outbreak as a whole. Right. So it, if I'm reading this right again, the, the vaccination campaign took place just, against, just among university students. And it looks like about a month afterwards, there was a pretty significant drop off in the cases. And they sort of peter out over the next semester. That's right. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the graph correctly. Maybe uh, Dr. Patel might want to respond. No. Hi, Manisha Patel. Um, yes, that's correct. And so if you look at the arrows that are pointing down, it's what you're referring to. Um, and then you'll see that it starts to drop off uh, just of note. There is a winter break, um, I believe, starting in sort of mid-December. And then, yes, it does start to peter out after that. Did, did vaccination control the outbreak? 
I mean, the, the data, the, the, the question is, did vaccination control the outbreak? Well, the data in the study suggests it does, um, but obviously the limitations that Dr. Cardamil also pointed out. But we feel that, as does the university, as does the health department, that this response in terms of control measures, vaccination response, did control this outbreak. Dr. Stevens? So two questions. One has to do with genotype and genotype drift. Can you kind of comment on whether there has been any evidence of, of genotype drift sequence, for example, in terms of the mumps virus? Second question has to do with antibody and whether antibody was looked at in this particular Iowa study. No, we did not um, have the opportunity to look at serologic data in this investigation, but Dr. Rhoda might want to comment on that. Uh, I'm uh, Paul Rhoda from the Mumps Laboratory. Uh, the question was about genotype, uh, genotype drift. We've been uh, monitoring the, the sequences of the mumps strains that have been circulating in the U.S. since uh, 2006. There's been a remarkably little sequence variation in the, in the small region that we're sequencing. So there's, there's, uh, the, the genotype uh, G has been consistently detected since uh, so the last several years. We're starting now to uh, introduce uh, next generation sequencing methods so that we can uh, do, develop whole genome sequences. And I expect that there will probably be uh, quite a large number of whole genome sequences available uh, very, very soon. But the, um, based on what we're looking at on a, a small uh, window, there's almost there's only one or two nucleotide changes in that uh, what the region that we use to determine the genotype. Uh, just to uh, finish the second question, no serologic studies were conducted with this outbreak. Dr. Walter? Uh, I guess there were cases amongst those who had three doses, is that correct? And what was the timing of those cases relative to vaccination? I'm not, I'm not quite clear on that from the data presented. Um, so there were a number of third dose vaccine failures, um, and they were spread out through throughout the outbreak period. Most of the third doses in this outbreak investigation were given right uh, during the vaccination campaign. And so the majority of those third dose failures we're going to see um, following that. Dr. Lee. Thank you for the excellent presentations. Uh, my question is, relates to uh, secular time as a potential confounder and whether or not you could consider another sensitivity analysis, which is just compare the two-dose versus three-dose recipients starting from the time of the initiation of the MMR uh, third-dose vaccination campaign, and if the results are very similar. I'm assuming they are, but it would be helpful to understand that. Yeah, and we did consider several potential um, methods for analysis, taking into consideration how data such as these had been analyzed in previous outbreak settings with a third dose campaign, um, and ultimately landed on the one that we used with the use of the time varying covariate because it does allow for the Cox. The Cox model does allow for an under, underlying uh, change in the hazard um, over time, and so what was challenging in this type of analysis and in many of these similar analyses is that the vaccination campaign doesn't occur all at all on one date. And so if it starts started on November 10th and through a series of different clinics um, had administ administration to a number of students all the way through November 19th, when do you start and end that period? And so um, if everyone was vaccinated on the same day and you could choose, as in some situations, um, perhaps like a three-week period post-intervention and then look before and after. Um, that's something that, um, that has been used previously, but in this particular scenario, because of the fluid um, nature of the way the outbreak progressed, as well as the vaccination campaign, we thought that this this method really allowed for a much more granular look at the data. It also allowed for us to look at the, the immune response um, post-vaccination, not just following the campaign, which occurred over a number of days, but also for those students who received third doses before and after the campaign. Dr. Reingold. So, so it's a very nice investigation of this outbreak. It's obviously very difficult to know what would have happened in the absence of, a, of administering a third dose. I mean, it's, it's always a speculation what would have happened had you not vaccinated. So I'm, I'm curious, are there enough outbreaks uh, to look at uh, sort of ecologically in terms of either duration of outbreaks or attack rates 
uh, in outbreaks where there has been a response with the vaccination versus those in which there hasn't. Uh, that might be a lot more interesting to do than what happens in the context of one outbreak. Thanks for that question. So a couple of things. One is that this particular outbreak we are going to be modeling to see what would have been the impact if there was not an implementation of a third dose, as well as varying coverage rates of the third dose. Um, Dr. Marin mentioned earlier that uh, there are actually a number of outbreaks that the work group is deliberating about. Um, New York City, for instance, they did not implement a third dose and looking at that ec ecologically. And the third piece is that um, Dr. Marin also mentioned that there is a data call that will be going out to the states to understand a couple of epidemiologic factors, what setting these outbreaks are happening in, what um, age groups, um, and what interventions are implemented, because not all the states are doing the same thing. And so hopefully in October we'll have more information on that for you. Dr. Atmar. I'd like to follow up on Dr. Lee's question because I mean, the, if, if the vaccine intervention came at the peak or the back end of the outbreak, um, I mean, one of the questions I was struggling with during the presentation was, you know, those persons who got a third dose and were included may have had a lower risk of, of infection and, and the type of analysis she proposed could address that. And even though it might be difficult, it would be reassuring if the uh, two-dose people after the, the end of the campaign plus some period for uh, a, an immune response to have occurred still had a higher risk than, than the three-dose. And, and it may not be the primary analysis, but it would be reassuring uh, secondary analysis. We did do a number of sensitivity analyses um, with those specific questions in mind. Um, and so one of the things that we, one of the things that is important to um, consider in this type of analysis is that the underlying risk is, is allowed to change over time when you're using the Cox regression. However, um, we uh, also did do a number of other analyses. So one of the things that we did was um, to exclude prior ca cases prior to the campaign and analyze the data starting on the first date of the campaign and going forward. Um, so what you're doing in that sense is uh, basically you're reducing the sample size of the number of cases. You're keeping in your analysis all of the students who had um, two doses at the start of the outbreak. Um, and in that analysis, um, the all of the um all of the V incremental VE estimates for all four models continue to be statistically significant. Dr. Plotkin. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I don't doubt that um, the the trouble with Geraldine's uh, strain uh, is the poor memory. The poor B cell memory has been demonstrated. So that's pretty clear as far as why there's fading. Now, but uh, I would just point out that there's a whole lot of, um, of uh, sp specific data about strains that is important. I think Dr. Rhoda will probably remember the Rubini strain, which was uh, promoted as a vaccine and which had zero efficacy. So the, the point is that we, in contrast, let's say, to measles and rubella, we know little about the protective uh, factors uh, uh, that, um, um, that generate protection from attenuated mump strains. And they do differ quite a lot. They're, they're not like measles and, and rubella. So um, I, and I also think that you might ask countries that use other strains, like Hoshino and, and Urabi, what their experience is with uh, persistence of, uh, of protection and uh, epidemics in, in those who have received the vaccine. Uh, because that might suggest a way of dealing with this uh, situation. Of course, the advantage of Geraldine is its safety, and we can't forget that. But um, I, I, the, you know, mumps is different. Mumps is a paramyxovirus. It has it's a whole lot of differences from other uh, viruses that we ordinarily uh, think about. And so, my counsel is that one is, I mean, the third dose may be 
useful uh, to deal with an emergency, but I think we have to go deeper into this problem. Can I just respond quickly to Musan, which is that, as usual, Dr. Plotkin, thank you. Um, we have thought about the fact that there are other countries besides the U.S. Unfortunately, few of them have as high MMR coverage as we do, but we are in contact with multiple other countries, and presumably at one of the next ACIP meetings, we'll be presenting some of that data. Thank you. Dr. Schaffner. Yeah, Bill Schaffner, NFID, thank you for these uh, nice presentations. This is a question for Dr. Marin. So in the pre-vaccine era, it was known that mumps often infected individuals asymptomatically. In fact, only about a third of people developed symptoms. And I was wondering, has anyone anywhere done a study of asymptomatic transmission in the setting of an immunized population? So that's my first question. Um, we have one study... Um or if you want to indicate that. Sure, thanks. Um, thank you. So we worked with um, Washington in, um, this year, actually, to conduct an asymptomatic shedding study. And this was during their UW outbreak that they ha were having earlier this year. And we found zero shedders among these individuals that were in this fraternity, sorority type of setting. Now, we only looked at shedding the component of the serologic response we did not we did not do in this particular study. But uh, like you mentioned, there's actually limited data in the post-vaccine, and I don't know, Paul, if you wanted to add to that. Well, the second question, thank you. I thought maybe you were going on. Uh, so the second question has to do with re-immunization, and I wonder if anyone studied very carefully the dynamics of what happens to the inoculated virus dose does it get a chance to replicate, and how much in the recipient who's already been previously immunized? Um, I, I'm not aware of studies, and um, actually that's a question that came up during work group discussions. Is there replication following the third doses, or is it just a boost due to encountering another uh, the antigen again? But um, other than the, the data I presented with, no. Um, uh, the the fourfold rise was well the uh, fold rise was low. Uh, what does that mean? Very few had four or more fold rise. Does that mean less no replication, less replication? We don't know. And I guess I have one last comment, which is only slightly snarky, but uh, perhaps one of the interventions might be to encourage our donor countries, those in Europe and perhaps the Philippines. That's where these viruses come from. If they immunize their kids, we'd have less mumps here too. Thank you. I think that applies to a few other diseases as well. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Hunter. So I'm, I'm tr struggling with the uh, vaccine effectiveness rate of 60% uh, at one week after the third dose. That seems awfully high to me. And it makes me wonder whether that the vaccine effectiveness in the 25% of students who got the third shot had to do with other behaviors that they might have had, like not sharing saliva, um, that would leave, lead to a, a you know, limitation of the study being an overestimate because of those reasons. And one of the things that I think would be really useful in future investigations like this, um, whenever possible, and something that we considered at length um, when we were designing this particular study was to survey the student body, um, both those who were vaccinated and those who were not vaccinated, to determine what exposures um, for each of the students and what kinds of behaviors they had um, to see if there would be any differences between the two-dose and the three-dose recipients. Um, when we came into this investigation, it was several months post the peak of the outbreak as well as post the vaccination campaign. And um, in talking with university officials and uh, looking back at their experiences in surveys of the student body, we were anticipating if anything, we would get a very, very low response rate. And so, and by the time that the survey would have been done, it would have essentially been conducted probably a year post outbreak, um, peak of the outbreak. And so at that point, you have, to con you have to worry about things like recall bias. And so, 
Um, I think certainly going forward, it would be very uh, informative and instructive to be able to do, conduct that kind of survey um, from the outset. In terms of interpreting the finding of uh, a response seven days post-vaccination, um, we do have limited um, data um, from prior studies on this. Dr. Marin presented the one that does exist that showed um, evidence of uh, seroconversion at seven to 10 days post-MMR3. It would be very instructive to certainly have more um, to support that. Dr. Zahn. Yeah, th thank you, Matt Zahn with Nature. It's, it's a great study. Um, from a local public health side, I, I mean, I guess the one question I think is going to come up a lot is, it really seems from this study that having a vaccine campaign at that point helped, but the question is going to be, what do you do then? You know, like in the first 10 cases, because I think the CDC's guidance specifically when consider a third dose of MMR right now says one specific is when you have a bunch of cases, you know, when you have a fair number of cases, which makes total sense because it's a big event, it's a big campaign, and do you really want to do that when you have 10 cases? On the other hand, for local, you know, small, small universities, they have 10 cases, well, it's still in the newspaper. And by now, everybody knows third dose of MMR is the most, not the most exotic thing in the world, so the question becomes very quickly, okay, we've had five or 10 cases, do we just sit and wait until there's a much larger number? You know, and I'm, I'm sure the work group is, is thinking about this and we'll, and we'll have guidance appropriately, but that is, you know, the specific, you know, the specific question that's a, a very hard one to answer, you know, that's, that, you know, that, that's gonna, gonna come up. How long do you wait before, you know, before you decide you have to, you have to do something because you feel, feel bad, you don't do something early and, and then you have a bigger outbreak later on. Thank you, Dr. Decker. You know, I, uh, I share the CDC team's conviction that a vaccination campaign must have helped. I have that bias very strongly myself. And I believe a third dose undoubtedly must help. But looking at this epi curve, it just seems to me that the ability to trust the analysis is shaken by, the, by an event over which you had no control and for which, you can, for which it's almost impossible to model. What I see is that you had a full generation of cases after the vaccination campaign. And then you sent most everybody home for a month, and when they came back, the outbreak was over. How do you model that? I also noticed that you've got some numerators there during Christmas break, so somebody stuck around in Iowa. But I don't know what the denominator was, and I don't know if you do either. I don't know if the attack rate was actually higher during the Christmas break when 90% of the kids went home and 10% stayed behind, but every one of them got mumps or not. And I don't know if you've got denominator data for that period. So I welcome your comment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Massonier. Um, so we could have a whole hour about this paper. And we're certainly happy. And the staff will stick around after the break if folks want to ask them questions. But we just want to point you back towards the initial presentation, which is what we're really looking for today from the ACIP members is, in addition to the things that they've told you they're doing, in the analysis that uh, Dr. Patel said, what else do you all want to see that will help you make a decision? Because as Dr. Zahn articulated, the question that you're faced with is, this is the vaccine we have, this is the data, kind of data we have, what else can we provide in terms of analysis or modeling that would help you make your decisions? Okay, well, since Thank you, asked, you. I'm, I'm just, oh. <laughs> uh, Dr. Lee. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to follow up because I, I think it's a very answerable question, and I think you have the data in hand. Okay. It's just a, a match cohort design sort of anchoring and matching on the date of vaccination, but match it to vote folks who only got two doses. And, and I think um, it would answer this question. I actually think it was effective. I just think it provides an additional level of um, certainty around the information, recognizing that you'll lose power, but that's why, as a secondary analysis, it's really helpful. Dr. Kimberlin. David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. Um, thank you very much. Very, very thorough uh, uh, presentations uh, and a very thoughtful discussion following. I, as I understand the initial uh, or, uh, introduction to the session, the vote is thought to be anticipated for February 2018. My question is, what do we anticipate to have in October 2017 that would put off making a recommendation as you know, hundreds of thousands of college students are getting ready to go off to college very shortly. Could this be done sooner, in other words? 
Dr. Moore, would you take that question since you're the chair of the work group? <laughs> sure, yes, I've had it before. And uh, the work group is working uh, as quickly as we can. The, what we have done through the last few months is really gotten the bulk of the data that's available to us now, presented to us. What we plan to be doing in the coming months in, in our discussions is actually digging into what we feel about those data, what else might be available to us in, a, in the near term that could help us make a clearer decision. What you've seen here is there are lots of, there are a few pieces of the puzzle and then there are missing pieces of the puzzle. I personally would really like to understand the quality of the antibodies that are produced by a third dose rather than just the quantitative minor bump, that shift in the curve. Does that shift represent higher quality antibodies that might have greater avidity for the G strain as opposed to the A strain? Is, is the, those are questions that Dr. Marin already mentioned that we don't yet have an answer to. We have that one piece of the puzzle but not the others. Um, we are interested in making a decision as quickly as we can, but it has to be based on evidence, not on speculation. And I think um, some of the information we hope for, the cost modeling, is going to be done over the summer. Um, and those are things that are ongoing. The other thing I really want to understand is what's going on in the natural experiments that are occurring, this data request to the states that was mentioned. Um, Every state's doing things a little differently right now, and um, we have some experience in Tennessee, as do others, and we may be able to glean some additional information beyond the results here that could help support a decision one way or the other. Um, but we generally like to be able to present information to the committee a session before a vote without having a lot of really new critical information presented at the time of a vote. If there were a way to parse out some piece in October that, that we felt was really relevant, we would push to do that. But at this point, I think we, we're still waiting for more information to support our decision. Thank you. I, I, with ongoing you know, epidemic kind of outbreaks, this could be that kind of circumstance from my standpoint anyway that would support the idea of moving more quickly in terms of not having a four month delay uh, between the presentation and the deliberation and vote. Um, I'll also point out that in 2012, these same discussions and presentations, not of the most recent outbreak, but of prior outbreaks occurred. And, and, and over the course of a year, the ACIP um, uh, deliberated on it and ultimately had a permissive use of a third dose uh, that, that health departments seem to want to receive. But uh, I'm sure the, the work group is, is utilizing that historic memory as well. Yes, I think we, we um, are very keen to get to evidence-based recommendations as quickly as possible. Um, and hopefully the outbreaks that are ongoing will give us an opportunity to gather more data to support a decision. Thank you. I think we'll let Dr. Moore have the last word. I, do you have I've more? already made the comment that, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. And, and move on to meningococcal vaccines. Dr. Stevens? Thank you very much for this really excellent session. So good morning. In uh, February of this year, we discussed considerations for men B booster doses for groups that increase risk for meningococcal uh, group B disease. There was concern or is concern about the rapid decline in immune correlates of protection by 12 months after uh, completion of the initial vaccination series. However, cases of group B meningococcal disease after vaccination have not been reported in persons at increased risk except for patients receiving eculizumab, and we'll talk about eculizumab more in the presentation, and additional data on antibody persistence and booster responses uh, was felt to be needed. In working uh, or con contacting the manufacturers, uh, Additional data uh, will be forthcoming within the next few months for uh, men uh, B4C, uh, Bexera, persistence at four years after the two-dose series and immune responses at three, seven, and 30 days after booster from Canadian and Australian adolescents is anticipated in July of this year. 
persistence up to seven years after two dose series and immune responses at three, seven, and 30 days, uh, 30 days after booster from uh, Chilean uh, adolescents is anticipated in September of 17, and persistence data for uh, Trememba uh, at one year after booster dose is anticipated in March of 2018. The work group will continue to review new data as it becomes available and, a, and will also uh, review the complete grade evaluation for men B boosters and bring back to ACP for consideration once additional data are evaluated and grade is complete. Today's section, uh, session will focus upon meningococcal disease and vaccine response in patients receiving uh, eculizumab. Uh, we're not anticipating an ACI vote on the topic, would, would appreciate the input from ACIP members. An additional note, uh, the policy recommendations, uh, updated recommendations concerning MinB, FHBP, remember, uh, have been recently published in May of, of, this, uh, of this year uh, in MMWR. I want to thank the working group members, uh, 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 those uh, some of you of which are here, uh, for their work with this uh, with uh, the meningococcal working group. And I'll turn the podium over to Dr. McNamara, who's going to talk about eculizumab. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to tell you about some work we've been doing to understand meningococcal disease cases, cases in patients receiving the medication eculizumab. And I hope after that we can have some discussion about the best way to protect these patients moving forward. So I'll start with a little bit of background about meningococcal disease and eculizumab, particularly what we already know about the risk of meningococcal disease in eculizumab recipients and strategies currently in place to mitigate this risk. Next, I'll tell you about a recent meningococcal disease case in an eculizumab recipient that we've investigated in some detail. And after that, I will share a data on additional cases that we've received in response to an EPI-X call for cases that we sent out to state and local health departments. Finally, I'll share a bit of in vitro data, uh, which is courtesy of Dan Granoff's laboratory at the Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute. And then I will summarize our main findings and concerns and open it up for discussion. So very briefly, meningococcal disease, which is caused by the bacterium Neisseria meningitidis, can present as meningitis, bloodstream infection, or both. The disease often starts with flu-like symptoms, but it can progress within hours to a serious illness that can include high fever, severe headache, stiff neck, confusion, and a rash. Meningococcal disease has a rapid onset and progression even in previously healthy people, and in some cases, death can occur less than a day after onset. About 10 to 20% of meningococcal disease patients die even with appropriate antibiotic treatment, and 11 to 19% of survivors have serious long-term health issues, such as cognitive deficits, hearing loss, or amputations due to necrosis of the extremities. Eculizumab, or Solaris, is a complement component inhibitor, specifically a monoclonal antibody against the complement component C5, which is licensed in the US for the treatment of two rare life-threatening illnesses. The first is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, for which eculizumab was licensed in 2007. For this illness, once a patient becomes ill enough to need eculizumab therapy, a lifelong course of eculizumab treatment is typically expected. The second illness is atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, for which eculizumab was approved in 2011. The optimal course of eculizumab therapy for AHUS is not clear. For some patients, lifelong treatment may be necessary, but for other patients, a shorter course of treatment may be viable. 
Both PNH and AHUS have an annual incidence of about 0.1 to 0.2 cases per 100,000 population. As a late complement component inhibitor, eculizumab is known to be associated with an increased risk of meningococcal disease. And the FDA approved prescribing information includes a black box warning for increased risk of meningococcal disease in eculizumab recipients. The manufacturer shared data on post-licensure cases of meningococcal disease among eculizumab recipients with FDA in 2014. And these data are publicly available online. The manufacturer reported 16 meningococcal disease cases, including one death, out of 5,207 person years of eculizumab exposure during 2007 to quarter one, 2014. The age range of these patients was 17 to 45 years. All of these patients had reportedly received meningococcal vaccination. And this report was prior to the licensure of serogroup B meningococcal vaccines. So presumably this means the patients received serogroup ACWY conjugate or polysaccharide vaccines. Of the 16 cases, one was serogroup B, two serogroups C, two serogroup Y, and 11 were reported to be due to an unknown serogroup. Overall, this is a meningococcal disease incidence in eculizumab recipients of 307 per 100,000 person years, which is 1 to 2,000 times greater than the baseline risk of meningococcal disease for healthy individuals in the U.S. Due to the increased risk of meningococcal disease with eculizumab, there is a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, or REMS, program in place for eculizumab. A REMS program is a program required by FDA to manage known or potential serious risks associated with a drug product. For Solaris, the purpose of the REMS program is to mitigate the occurrence and morbidity associated with meningococcal infections by informing healthcare providers and patients about the increased risk for meningococcal infections with Solaris, the early signs of invasive meningococcal infections, and the need for immediate medical evaluation of signs and symptoms consistent with possible meningococcal infections. The Solaris REMS program includes a patient medication guide, which is FDA-approved patient-focused labeling to help the patient understand the risk of meningococcal disease associated with Solaris as well as a patient safety information card that patients can carry in their wallet for their own reference and to alert providers to their increased risk of meningococcal disease. The program also includes prescriber certification in which providers must agree to counsel patients and provide the patients with educational materials, provide the medication guide to patients prior to each infusion, and review the educational materials and product labeling themselves and comply with directions for safe use, including ensuring that patients receive a meningococcal vaccine. However, the program materials do not include specific information about the different serogroup ACWY or serogroup B vac meningococcal vaccines that are now available. In addition, providers must promptly report meningococcal disease cases to FDA or Alexion, the manufacturer. Monitoring of the REMS program is ongoing, and REMS assessments are submitted to FDA by the manufacturer every two years. Current ACIP guidelines indicate that eculizumab recipients should receive both serogroup ACWY and serogroup B meningococcal vaccines. The eculizumab product insert indicates that meningococcal vaccination should be administered at least two weeks prior to initiating eculizumab treatment. If eculizumab treatment is initiated within two weeks of vaccination, the eculizumab product insert indicates that in clinical trials, antibiotic prophylaxis was usually provided until at least two weeks after vaccination. The insert further states that the benefits and risks of antibiotic prophylaxis have not been established. So with that, I'll return to, I'll turn to a case report that we became aware of late last year. So 
This report was of a tragic fatal meningococcal disease case in a 16-year-old girl with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria who had just begun receiving eculizumab for PNH treatment. This case was initially reported to us as serogroup B. As shown in this timeline, the patient had received both men ACWI and men B vaccines about six months prior to beginning treatment with eculizumab. Just one week after starting eculizumab therapy, the patient developed meningococcal disease. Initially, she presented with headache, one episode of vomiting, and generalized body pain, and she quickly went to the ER. However, she had no fever, and her symptoms uh, resolved completely after treatment with an NSAID and anti-nausea medication. She was therefore discharged. Later that night, however, she developed purpura and became unresponsive. She was transported to an emergency department, but unfortunately died from waterhouse friedrichsen syndrome. The infecting meningococcal strain was sent to CDC, where additional testing showed that the strain was actually non-groupable, not serogroup B. So let me just pause for a second to explain what it means for a meningococcal strain to be non-groupable. Meningococcal bacteria are classified into serogroups based on the polysaccharide capsule, which is a key virulence factor that helps the bacterium evade the host immune response. There are 12 serogroups, but six of these, A, B, C, W, X, and Y, are the primary causes of meningococcal disease worldwide. Non-groupable meningococcal bacteria are those that do not express the polysaccharide capsule at all. There are two reasons that a Neisseria meningitidis isolate might be classified as non-groupable. First, the bacteria might have a functional capsule gene and just not be expressing it, but they may have the capacity to turn capsule expression back on at a later point. Alternatively, the bacteria might lack the capsule gene altogether or have another major defect in the capsule expression machinery and therefore be incapable of turning on capsule expression. Non-groupable meningococci very rarely cause invasive disease. However, asymptomatic carriage of non-groupable meningococci is very common. We've recently performed several carriage evaluations among US college students, and we've found that 10 to 24% of students have asymptomatic carriage of Neisseria meningitidis at any given time. The vast majority of these carried meningococci are non-groupable. So to return to the case report, in this instance, the strain was determined to be non-groupable by slide agglutination, or SASG, which looks for expression of the capsule, as well as by PCR, which looks for the capsule gene, and by whole genome sequencing. Whole genome sequencing, in fact, demonstrated a complete absence of the capsule gene, showing that this strain really had no capacity to turn capsule expression back on. Whole genome sequencing also showed that the sequence type or strain of the isolate was ST2578, which is more commonly associated with asymptomatic carriage rather than invasive disease. The meningococcal serogroup ACWY vaccines are based on the polysaccharide capsule antigen, so they of course will not be able to provide any protection against non-groupable meningococci. The men B vaccines, though, are based on proteins that are not unique to serogroup B meningococci and that are potentially found in non-groupable meningococci as well. However, the extent of men B vaccine cross-protection for non-groupable meningococcal strains has not been assessed. Our lab looked at the men B4C antigen sequences in the strain isolated from this case and determined that, in fact, the sequences of two of the antigens, FHBP and NHBA, were extremely similar to or identical to the antigens contained in men B4C. NAD A was not present, and the poor A sequence in the strain did not match the poor A antigen in the vaccine. Dan Granoff's laboratory performed some additional testing for us and showed that there was high expression of both FHBP and NHBA on this isolate based on flow cytometry. To better understand the capacity of men B4C to protect against this strain, we also asked Dan Granoff to perform serum bactericidal activity testing. He assessed serum bactericidal activity in serum collected from six healthy adults 
before, one month after, and four to six months after receipt of either two or three doses of MenB4C vaccine. The results of this testing are shown in this graph, with one over the titer on the y-axis and the six subjects on the x-axis. A titer of one to four is usually considered protective. What you can see here in the gray bars is that all six adults had pre-immunization titers of greater than one to 16, showing that even without immunization, the serum from all six of these adults was easily able to kill this bacterial strain. Titers further increased following MenB4C immunization, although in most subjects they decreased to near baseline by four to six months after vaccination. Like the whole genome sequencing data, these data suggest that this is not a meningococcal strain that would typically be able to cause disease. Finally, we were also interested in looking at the patient's antibody levels to the antigens in the MenB4C vaccine. The patient had a serum sample collected three days post-mortem, and we sent this serum sample to Dan's lab uh, for characterization. He compared the level of antibodies observed in the patient's serum specimen to the levels observed in specimens from other healthy adolescents who either had not received MenB4C vaccine or who were seven months out from receiving the second MenB4C vaccine dose, much like this patient. His data show that the patient's anti-FHBP and anti-NHBA levels were much higher than levels observed in vaccinated healthy individuals, whereas the patient's anti-NADA levels were comparable to those in unvaccinated individuals. These data show that at the time the patient died, she had very high antibody levels to the FHBP and NHBA present in the infecting strain, suggestive of a memory antibody response to these antigens. So to summarize the data from this case report, this was a fatal meningococcal disease case in an adolescent who had been treated with eculizumab and who had been vaccinated with both men ACWY and men B vaccines about six months prior to disease onset. The strain was found to be non-groupable both phenotypically by slide agglutination and genotypically by PCR and whole genome sequencing. Men B4C vaccine was expected to provide protection against this strain based on antigen typing, but in fact, serum from normal healthy adults, both pre and post immunization from men B4C, easily killed this strain. The patient furthermore died despite what appeared to be a strong memory antibody response to this strain. Together, these data demonstrate that this case was caused by a meningococcal strain that would normally be expected to be non-pathogenic, but that in this patient caused fatal illness in spite of appropriate meningococcal vaccination. After hearing about this case report, we put out an EPIAX call for cases to try to learn about additional meningococcal disease cases in eculizumab recipients in the United States. So for those who are not familiar with EPIX, um, this is CDC's web-based communications platform to share and request preliminary health surveillance information. And it includes users from CDC as well as state health departments. In this call for cases, we requested that state and large local health departments review existing case investigation records to identify meningococcal disease cases in eculizumab recipients from 2007 to present. We posted the EPIX on February 3rd of this year and have been following up directly with sites via email. Please note that we did not ask sites to obtain new information on cases or review medical records, although some sites chose to do so. This was just an initial attempt to find out what information the sites already had on cases in eculizumab recipients. So far, we've received responses from 46 jurisdictions and have identified a total of 16 cases, including the one I just described in detail. Please note that these are not the same 16 cases I mentioned in the introduction, um, which were reported by the manufacturer back in 2014, although the cases do likely overlap. For the 16 cases that we identified through the EPIX, the median case age was 30 years, with a range of 16 to 83. 10 of the patients were taking eculizumab for treatment of PNH, 
five for AHUS, and one for DevX disease through a clinical trial. All 16 of the cases presented with bloodstream infection, while only six had evidence of meningitis. All of the patients were hospitalized for an average of 6.6 .6 days, range of one to 14 days. The only fatality was the case report that we just reviewed. So we wanted to know the serogroup causing each of these cases. This table shows the serogroup of the cases by slide agglutination, which again is looking at capsule expression, as well as by PCR, which looks at whether the capsule gene is present. Five of these cases were non-groupable by PCR, showing that they don't have the gene to produce a capsule. And six more were non-groupable by slide agglutination, but did have a capsule gene detected by PCR. We're currently working on whole genome sequencing of these strains to better understand whether these are strains that can readily turn capsule on and off, or if there are other genetic defects preventing capsule expression. This work is still in progress, but we have completed sequencing for a few of these strains already, so I can tell you that at least three of these six strains do have clear defects in the capsule operon that are expected to prevent capsule expression. So that brings us to a total of at least eight of 16 cases, or 50%, that are caused by strains that look like they're really non-groupable. We also collected information on case vaccination status, and we found that of the 15 patients with known vaccination status, only nine or 60% had documented receipt of men ACWY vaccine prior to meningococcal disease onset. Of the cases with disease onset in 2015 to 16 after licensure of the men B vaccines, only three of seven or 43% had received one or more doses of men B vaccine. Complete vaccination data are always challenging to obtain, particularly for adults, and thus these data may not be complete, but they suggest that not all eculizumab recipients are receiving the ACIP-recommended meningococcal vaccinations. Of the four patients with disease caused by meningococci that were both phenotypically and genotypically serogroup Y, and so theoretically preventable with men ACWY vaccine, two or 50% had documented prior men ACWY vaccination. This is consistent with the data the manufacturer shared with FDA and prior reports showing that serogroup C, W, and Y disease could all occur in eculizumab recipients in spite of prior men ACWY vaccination. Finally, one patient was noted to be receiving prophylactic penicillin at the time of disease onset. However, this patient reported poor compliance. So to summarize the EPIX data, among these reports, we're seeing a high frequency of cases due to non-groupable meningococci, with at least eight of 16 total cases, or 50%, due to non-groupable strains. Five cases were due to meningococci that are non-groupable by PCR, and three more were phenotypically non-groupable by slide agglutination, had a gene for serogroup B, C, or Y capsule detected by PCR, but had a capsule operon defect that would prevent capsule expression that was identified by whole genome sequencing. Further characterization of additional isolates is ongoing. 40% of cases with known men ACWY vaccination status and 57% of cases with known men B vaccination status had not, or, and with disease onset in 2015 to 16, had not been vaccinated with the respective vaccine prior to disease onset. Although again, routine case investigations may not always capture a patient's full vaccination history. Finally, two of four or 50% of the cases caused by meningococci that were phenotypically serogroup Y occurred in people who did have prior men ACWY vaccination documented. Together, these data suggest that vaccination provides incomplete protection to eculizumab recipients, both because of breakthrough cases uh, of the serogroups that should be covered by the vaccines and because of the fairly high incidence of cases due to non-groupable meningococcal bacteria for which men ACWY vaccine provides no protection and for which the potential for cross-protection with men B vaccines has not been assessed. 
Finally, I want to briefly show you just a little bit of in vitro data um, that may shed some light on why patients on eculizumab therapy are so susceptible to meningococcal disease. So as I mentioned earlier, eculizumab binds to complement component C5 and blocks cleavage of this component into C5A and C5B. C5B is needed for the membrane attack complex, which underlies serum bactericidal activity. So based on this, we would expect that serum bactericidal activity would be heavily impaired in eculizumab recipients. In the absence of SBA, meningococcal killing would hopefully be accomplished through opsonophagocytosis. However, C5A, the other product of C5, promotes the inflammation and phagocytosis. So an open question is whether eculizumab might also inhibit uh, opsonophagocytosis in addition to SBA. So to get at this question, Dan Granoff's lab has been performing some studies looking at the effects of eculizumab on whole blood killing of meningococci, which should encompass both SBA and opsonophagocytosis. This is a summary of the results. These graphs show geometric mean colony forming units per mil of two different meningococcal strains, a serogroup B strain on the left and a serogroup C strain on the right, following a three-hour incubation with whole blood from 12 subjects who have all received both men ACWI conjugate and men B vaccines. So the first bar shows the CFU detected at time zero. In the second blue bar, you can see that after a three-hour incubation with no inhibitor, both strains of bacteria are consistently killed. The orange bar shows what happens when a physiologically relevant concentration of eculizumab is added. Instead of being killed, the bacteria are able to rapidly replicate. Dan performed a similar assay using the non-groupable strain from the fatal case I told you about in the first part of this presentation. In this case, the assay was performed with whole blood from just one healthy donor, um, a healthy adult who had received two doses of men B4C. You can see that even this unencapsulated strain, which we saw previously is easily killed by serum from most healthy unvaccinated adults, cannot be killed by whole blood from a vaccinated donor in the presence of eculizumab. Together, these data suggest that either eculizumab does inhibit opsonophagocytic activity or that opsonophagocytosis in the absence of SBA is not able to inhibit growth of these strains, even in whole blood from vaccinated donors. So to summarize what I've shown you, um, eculizumab is associated with a one to 2,000 fold increased incidence of meningococcal disease. And the case report and EPIX data we've collected suggest that a high proportion of the meningococcal disease cases in eculizumab recipients in the US are due to non-groupable Neisseria meningitidis. These meningococci do not usually cause disease, and since they lack a capsule, no protection against them is offered by men ACWY vaccine. The men B vaccines may theoretically provide protection against these strains, but the proportion of non-groupable strains for which men B vaccines might offer cross-protection has not been evaluated. Furthermore, both in the data we collected through the EPIX and in prior reports from the manufacturer and the literature, we've seen that breakthrough serogroup C, W, and Y cases can occur in eculizumab recipients in spite of men ACWY vaccination. We've also heard of a few case reports from other countries of serogroup B meningococcal disease in eculizumab recipients who have received a men B vaccine. Finally, in vitro data from Dan Granoff's laboratory show that eculizumab not only blocks SBA, but it also impairs whole blood killing of meningococci, showing that opsonophagocytosis is either inhibited by eculizumab or is inadequate for meningococcal killing in the absence of SBA. So together, these points lead us to two key concerns. The first is that patients on eculizumab are at risk of meningococcal disease, due to both typical disease-causing strains and strains that do not normally cause disease, but that are frequently carried asymptomatically in the nasopharynx. And second, the vaccination offers limited or possibly no protection against meningococcal disease in patients taking eculizumab. 
So in reviewing these data, we've been discussing whether there should be a role for antibiotic chemoprophylaxis for patients taking eculizumab. Some countries recommend antibiotic prophylaxis for the duration of eculizumab treatment. UK guidance states that patients are advised to take daily prophylactic antibiotics, either penicillin or erythromycin for those with penicillin allergies. And similarly, guidance in France is to take continuous antibiotic chemoprophylaxis until 60 days after stopping eculizumab treatment. In the US, we're aware that some individual providers also choose to recommend antibiotic prophylaxis for the duration of eculizumab treatment for some or all of their patients. However, there's no official guidance on this topic in the US. Based on the literature and recommendations in other countries, penicillin appears to be the most commonly used antibiotic for long-term prophylaxis for eculizumab recipients. However, there are limited data available on the efficacy of this prophylaxis. Meningococcal strains with both intermediate susceptibility to penicillin and penicillin resistance have been identified, and there are a few published reports of breakthrough cases in eculizumab recipients um, who are taking penicillin that are due to meningococcal strains with intermediate penicillin susceptibility or resistance. Recent studies of invasive meningococcal isolates from the U.S. showed that between 10 and 37 percent had intermediate susceptibility to penicillin. However, frank penicillin resistance remains rare and has been identified in only about 1 percent of U.S. strains. Several studies in Europe have found similar or greater prevalence of intermediate susceptibility and resistance to penicillin among invasive isolates. But again, the majority of these isolates have intermediate susceptibility rather than full resistance. The clinical implications of intermediate penicillin susceptibility are not clear. Although there are also limited data specifically assessing the safety of long-term penicillin therapy, it's generally considered to be safe and is routinely used for prophylaxis for rheumatic fever, as well as prevention of streptococcus pneumoniae infection in asplenic children. So that brings us to our key discussion question, which is whether antibiotic chemoprophylaxis for meningococcal disease should be recommended for eculizumab recipients in the US in addition to vaccination. And if so, should this be penicillin, or are there other good options for long-term antibiotic prophylaxis? Should antibiotics be recommended for all eculizumab recipients or for a subset? For instance, those expected to have a shorter course of treatment. Some AHUS patients may have a shorter course of treatment than PNH patients, for instance, for whom treatment is typically expected to be lifelong. Or should prophylaxis be limited to those in higher risk age groups? We don't really have data on which age groups of eculizumab recipients are at highest risk, but in the general population, we know that infants, adolescents, and older adults are at higher risk for meningococcal disease. Or if we're concerned about disease that's due to strains that are more commonly associated with asymptomatic carriage, we also know that asymptomatic carriage typically peaks among young adults. So as David mentioned, we're not anticipating an ACIP vote on this topic, but we did want to open this up for discussion with all of you to get your insight and ideas. We're hoping you can also identify additional stakeholders to engage on this issue. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to open this up for discussion. And of course, I'm also happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that very thorough review and discussion. Um, Dr. Romero. <coughs> So again, let me echo that. This was a fantastic presentation, a fantastic dissection of a problem, um, a comment. Um, these biologics are very important, but as we use them, we learn more about their unintended side effects. Um, I think that um, I think that antibiotic prophylaxis, chemoprophylaxis, needs to be considered for these patients. I mean, that's just my opinion right off the bat. I don't know that you have enough information in this in populations using this drug to break it out into saying it's an infant, an adolescent, or an a young adult that requires this. And I would probably recommend, without looking at the data closer, that all persons receiving uh, eculizumab, whether short-term or long-term, receive antimicrobial prophylaxis. Whether that antimicrobial prophylaxis should be penicillin or some other drug, I think we need to talk a little bit more about that. But certainly, 
you're one of the patients that you talked about had uh, non-compliance or non-full compliance to the regimen. So uh, that brings to mind, does this now, do you need to consider other options? Benzathine, penicillin, or things that we use for rheumatic heart disease patients in whom we're concerned they're not going to take the medication. But again, there are strains that have intermediate resistance and it may be difficult to get high enough levels to prevent it. The last thing to consider would be, do these patients need a salvage protocol? So there are patients that have um, uh, uh, cell-mediated defects or congenital neutropenias that we tell their parents, here is a dose of X. You keep this dose of X, and when the child gets sick, you give it to them immediately and proceed to the emergency room. Should they have that safety blanket in their, in their cupboard? and whatever that may be. Uh, but that's one other thing to think about. I have a quick question. Um, you indicated that there were 16 cases that had been reported to the manufacturer, but you also indicated that the cases you reported on were different cases. Do we have any comparable data on the uh, additional 16 cases that have been reported to the manufacturer? Is there a way to to um, learn from those cases as well as the cases you're aware of? Um, yeah, so the 16 cases reported from the manufacturer were cases that occurred from 2007 to quarter one 2014, whereas R16 um, occurred between 2008 and 2016. So we know that they are different cases, but likely some of them are the same. We, we don't have access to very much information on the cases um, that have been reported to the manufacturer, uh, aside from what I have shown you the information on the SEER group, the age range, we certainly don't have um, you know, information on the isolates associated with those cases at this point. But we're working to obtain that information. <laughs> yes. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, my brain is slow. Um, an idea, a thought just came to me. Um, so are we seeing a higher incidence of other bacterial infections, pneumococcal disease or anything else with these? So in the full report to FDA, there was um, documentation of other infections that have occurred in aculizumab recipients. Um, there's certainly nothing that looks like it has as dramatic an increase um, as the meningococcal disease. And the REMS program and the black box warning are therefore specifically focused on meningococcal disease. Dr. Hunter. So we've talked a little bit about the numerator with the 16 and overlapping there, but what about the denominator of uh, prevalence of uh, the diseases for which eculimimimizab is used? Um, <laughs> um, uh, and my guess is it's somewhere around 10,000 if you take uh, one to two per million and um, multiply that by 300 million and then estimate, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years uh, after diagnosis or onset of the disease for a lifetime after this? Am I in the right ballpark for the denominator? Um, yes, I think you're, you're doing your math correctly. We, we don't have information um, specifically on the denominator aside from the information that was shared with the manufacturer um, with FDA, the 5,207 person years of exposure in the U.S. Uh, from 2007 to 2014. It's important to note that not all people with PNH and AHUS would be on eculizumab therapy um, at any given time. So uh, in my role as the STD um, consultant for... Uh, City of Milwaukee Health Department, I would argue in favor of or against using uh, benzathine penicillin as a prophylaxis so that we have it available for syphilis. Thank you. Dr. Walter. I had the qu same question about denominator data for use of the medication, but I would concur with Dr. Romero in recommending use of, of prophylaxis in this case. Ms. Pellegrini. <clears throat> thank you, and, and thank you for a really excellent and understandable, well-presented report. Um, this is the case study in particular was in incredibly tragic. I can't imagine losing a 16-year-old to essentially a bolt from the blue when you thought you were in the process of improving their condition and quality of life. Um, I was very troubled by the reports that you had of um, under-vaccination of this population. And whether that is due to providers not being diligent or patients not complying, it seems to me like there's a real role for CDC and FDA 
to work together and looking at the, at the compliance with the REMS requirements. And there is, there's a lot of responsibility to go around here, but if the REMS requirements are not being abided by appropriately, that is a tremendous problem. Can we ask FDA to comment on that, since that's really an FDA role? Dr. Sun. Yes, uh, I mean, I, as you can see, I mean, the REMS, REMS is fairly detailed and, and comprehensive, and uh, the manufacturers are, are uh, I mean, these are reviewed also periodically, so they're, you know, the, the, those kinds of data, compliance and so on, would be, are, are evaluated. And, uh, but I, I understand that um, uh, the point being made about uh, the, the need for vaccination, but I think it's also in, in important that to recognize that, um, that I think in this particular case, uh, vaccination may provide some false sense of security that it's actually doing something and, and may not. May I, may I just add to my point? I think the vaccination was only one point. I think there's a very real possibility here that the, if the vaccines aren't happening, there's no reason to think the education is happening either and that parents or caregivers or patients themselves are being appropriately sensitized to what they need to look for and how to care for themselves. Thank you, Dr. Atmar. Um, I, I guess before weighing in on uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis, I, I would like to uh, understand more about what the MIC <clears throat> minimal inhibitory concentration, 50%, 90%, is for meningococci compared to a group A strep or, or strep pneumo where it's been used uh, effectively. I, I mean, I... If the MIC are similar, I think there's a, a real chance that it will be a benefit. But if they're a log higher on average, then um, there, this may be another false sense of security uh, that um, people would have um, and relying on, on antimicrobial prophylaxis since there have been failures that have been observed. Thank you. I think that would be very interesting to look at. So I, I think, as uh, I think Lucy said, most of the strains in this country remain susceptible to penicillin uh, at, lo at, at, at uh, uh, reasonable MICs. Uh, there are some intermediate strains. I think it's on the order of 20% or so are, are intermediate. One consideration to Dr. Romero's point could be ceftriaxone as a I am, uh, we use that, uh, or it's used in other countries in settings where meningococcal disease is suspected, and I think that could be to the recommend to the point made about providing families with ceftriaxone as an IM injection, for example, in cases like this. Uh, and ceftriaxone could be potentially used uh, as a as an as a longer term uh, prevention me um, uh, methodology in this particular. That's a suggestion or an idea. Dr. Friedland. Uh, thank you, Leonard Friedman from GSK. Thank you very much for a very important and informative discussion today. I just uh, want to mention a few things. This is a, a very challenging area. I want to bring to the attention of the committee that there's going to be an international workshop held in September 2017 in Prague on meningococcal disease and complement deficiency to continue to understand the knowledge in this very important area. You know, the, the data remain limited and are technically challenging, and thank you for elucidating it as, as well as you did. Um, I do want to draw attention to the committee that at the last meeting in, fe in February of 2017, GSK did present a results of a clinical study of individuals who had immunodeficiencies, including seven patients who were treated with eclumizumab. Just as a reminder, in that uh, study, uh, those patients who were receiving eclumizumab did have the lowest response compared to other complement deficiencies, although there was evidence of HSB activity in some individuals. Um, and in addition, at the September 2016 International Patho Pathogenia Neisseria Conference held in the United Kingdom, there was a presentation from Public Health England on their results of 23 individuals who have received eclumizumab, uh, and there they found that uh, while eclumizumab blocks SBA activity, it wasn't blocked in all subjects. But interestingly, they found that OPA activity was maintained and wasn't blocked in their subjects 
concluding that vaccination can still be beneficial for these patients. So just additional information and again, the international conference that will be held in September on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further or shall we move on? Okay, uh, our next presentation is going to be on anthrax and uh, Dr. Hendricks is up, I believe. Is she here? There she is. Hi, welcome. And thank you to the anthrax group for uh, putting up with our moving you from yesterday to today. We really appreciate the flexibility and thank you for coming again, Dr. Hendricks. I'll be discussing updating recommendations for the use of anthrax vaccine in the U.S. How does this work? I'm sorry. Is it the remote? For those of you who are looking in your packets, it's tab six. For background, I'll briefly discuss the disease anthrax, the vaccine, the current recommendations, and approval of two antitoxins for post-exposure prophylaxis. Then I'll switch to the work group and discuss reasons for reconvening, a new formulation of AVA, our terms of reference, and show a list of the work group members. <clears throat> Bacillus anthracis is the causative agent of anthrax. It's a gram-positive spore-forming bacterium Spores are the infective form and are similar in size uh, to the tuberculosis bacilli, which makes them more spirable. The vegetative form produces two major toxins, lethal toxin and edema toxin. In nature, anthrax is primarily a disease of herbivores. In the late 19th and early 20th century, it was an important occupational disease in humans. Since then, it has occurred primarily among people who have butchered and or eaten diseased animals, and very sporadically among people who incidentally inhale the spores during the course of their work or hobby. A little more about the natural cycle. Herbivores graze on land contaminated with spores, which germinate and cause anthrax. They then die, exsanguinate, and further contaminate the grazing land. As just mentioned, humans are infected by butchering and are eating the dead or dying animals. Biting flies can also carry the bacterium from carcasses to healthy animals. Spores introduced through the skin lead to cutaneous anthrax. Those that are swallowed lead to ingestion anthrax. Those introduced through the lungs to inhalation anthrax, and those introduced in a percutaneous manner to injection anthrax. Meningitis may complicate primary anthrax infections of the skin, gastrointestinal tract, and soft tissue, or may occur as primary anthrax meningitis. After gaining entry, B. anthracis spores are thought to either germinate locally or to be transported by phagocytic cells to the lymphatics and regional lymph nodes where they can germinate. Bacteria begin producing toxin within hours of germination. Cutaneous anthrax is by far the most common form of anthrax. Spores are introduced through the skin, usually but not always through pre-existing abrasions. Infections can remain local or can lead to systemic illness in about a third of the cases. Germination occurs one to three hours after inoculation. Incubation takes one to 17 days. In the early 1900s, the case fatality rate without treatment was 24%. With treatment, less than 2% of cases, patients with cutaneous anthrax die. Ingestion anthrax is the second most common form of naturally occurring anthrax. Following a one to, day, four, one to 14 day incubation, the infection can manifest either in the oropharynx or lower in the gastrointestinal system. The case fatality rate is 40%, but may be higher in children. Inhalation of aerosolized spores from hair, hives, or biowarfare or bioterror related events leads to inhalation anthrax. Most of the cases described in the medical literature are either occupational or biowarfare or bioterrorism related. There are very few uh, naturally occurring inhalation anthrax cases. The range for the observed incubation period in humans is longer than those observed for other forms of anthrax. In 1979, there was an anthrax outbreak that occurred following an accidental release of B. anthracis from a biowarfare program in Sverdlovsk, USSR. 
The incubation period there ranged from two to 43 days. In the 2001 anthrax letter incidents in the US, incubations ranged from five to 13 days. Data from non-human primates are consistent with slightly longer incubations than the 43 days. The case fatality rate has improved somewhat with modern critical care, but is still very high. In the 20th century, the case fatality rate exceeded 90%. Since then, with modern critical care that includes combination antimicrobials and drainage of fluorofluid, it has still approached 50%. A new type of anthrax has been identified in the last decade or two in heroin-injecting drug users in Northern Europe. These are severe soft tissue infections that are deep under the skin in, or in the muscle where the drug was injected. Transmission is from injection of contaminated heroin, the incubation is from two to 10 days, and the case fatality rate with treatment approaches 40%. Meningitis is a very common complication of inhalation, ingestion, injection, and systemic cutaneous anthrax. More than half of the autopsy do done on patients who died with inhalation anthrax in Sredlovsk showed hemorrhagic meningitis. In fact, the first two cases uh, in Sverdlovsk were um, anthrax meningitis cases. Meningitis can also occur as a primary manifestation of anthrax and is, and is thought by some to be uh, a type of inhalation anthrax. This distribution map color codes countries by numbers of outbreaks reported during the 2005 to 2016 time period and includes livestock, wildlife, and human data. Purple and red countries have the most reported outbreaks. Green and yellow countries have the fewest reported outbreaks. The data come from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and the map likely underrepresents the true disease distribution. This bar chart shows human anthrax cases reported in the US in the latter half of the 20th century. In 1957, a large epizootic in Oklahoma sparked a national annual vaccination of livestock against anthrax. Only five cases occurred from 1980 through 1999. The 2001 anthrax letter incident is shown to the right. We've had no cases from 2014 to 2017. For a variety of reasons, anthrax spores are the most likely bioweapon. Anthrax spores are relatively easy to produce, can be stored a long time, can be dispersed in the air through a variety of means. They are odorless, colorless, tasteless, and difficult to detect. The resulting disease, inhalation anthrax, is highly lethal. The spores may survive for greater than 40 years. An aerosol release can cause widespread illness and death among unprotected persons. A 1979 release of anthrax spores from a laboratory in Sverdlovsk led to 77 cases of anthrax and 66 deaths in the nearby community. The 2001 US mail incident led to 22 cases of anthrax, 11 of which were inhalation anthrax with five deaths. In a simulated unmitigated wide area anthrax release in a subway system, it's estimated that there would be in excess of 100,000 casualties. Anthrax vaccine absorbed also known as Biothrax, was manufactured for a few decades by the Michigan Department of Health, but is now manufactured by Emergent Biosolutions. AVA is a sterile, cell-free filtrate made from an avirulent, toxigenic, but non-encapsulated strain of B. anthracis. The final product contains 1.2 milligrams per mil of aluminum for an adjuvant, and benzothonium chloride and formaldehyde as preservatives. I'm gonna show this slide twice, once here in the discussion about AVA, and then again when I briefly mention antitoxins. The two main toxins produced by psilocinthrasis each come in two parts. One of the parts is protective antigen, depicted here as a red oval. For either toxin to enter the cell, protective antigen needs to bind to the anthrax toxin receptor, then form a heptamer and have the toxins attached. The cell surface invaginates and protective antigen later forms a pore through which the edema factor and lethal factor escape into the cell. If an antibody interferes with protective antigen and keeps it from binding to the anthrax toxin receptor, the whole cascade can be stopped. The vaccine under discussion today, AVA, primes the immune system to recognize and block protective antigen, which is common to all anthrax strains. 
Vaccine efficacy against numerous anthrax strains has been demonstrated in many animal studies. This vaccine has a long history. In the mid-1950s, there was the Fort Detrick formulation. The first US product was a cell-free filtrate from an aerobic culture of the volum strain of B. anthracis precipitated with alum. This vaccine provided protection in monkeys, caused minimal reactivity and short-term adverse effects in humans, and was used in Dr. Brockman's efficacy study of human vaccination against anthrax in mill workers. In the 1950s, the manufacturing process was improved, resulting in increased PA concentration and increased purity and potency. The new formulation was referred to as the Lansing formulation. In the 1970s, the Lansing formulation was licensed by NIH using data from the Brockman studies. The vaccine was recommended for those at high risk of exposure to anthrax. AVA was reapproved for licensure by the FDA in 1985. Immunogenicity and reactogenicity data on AVA were reviewed by ACIP in 2007 through 2009, and the current guidelines were published in 2010. New data are available for post-exposure use of AVA plus CPG7909, also known as Nuthrax. Synthetic oligonucleotides with CP CPG motifs trigger cells with toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors are a type of pathogen recognition receptor that are exposed primarily, expressed pri primarily on immune cells. The utility of CPG oligonucleotides as vaccine adjuvants has been evaluated in a number of clinical trials. Results indicate that CPG oligonucleotides prov prov improve antigen presentation in the generation of vaccine-specific cellular and humoral responses. Compared with AVA, AVA plus CPG is expected to achieve an accelerated immune response, necessitating fewer injections and reduced amount of antigen to confer protection. As shown a few minutes ago, antibodies that interfere with protective antigen binding to the anthrax receptor, whether they are from vaccination or passive transfer, keep the two main toxins from being released. Three antitoxins are approved for treatment of inhalation anthrax in combination with antimicrobials, rexabacumab, anthem, and anthracil, or um, AIGIV. AIGIV is polyclonal, and the other two are monoclonal. Anthrax vaccine adsorbed has two uses. It is used for pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, which used to be called general use prophylaxis, GUP, in persons with occupational risk exposure to bacillus and thracis. It is also used for post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP, for persons that potentially exposed to bacillus and thracis. For pre-exposure prophylaxis, AVA is recommended for the prevention of disease caused by bacillus thracis in persons 18 through 65 years of age at high risk of exposure. For this indication, it is administered intramuscularly at a one-half mil dose at zero, one, and six months for the primary series, and at 12 and 18 months after the start of the primary series, and then at one-year intervals thereafter for persons at continued risk of infection. Groups considered to be at high risk of infection include persons handling potentially infected animals in research, in research settings or in areas with a high incidence of enzootic anthrax or when standards and restrictions are insufficient to prevent exposure to B. anthracis, persons who perform certain types of laboratory work involving B. anthracis, persons involved in anthrax environmental investigations or remediation efforts, certain military personnel, and it also may be offered, excuse me, it also may be offered to persons involved in emergency response activities. For post-exposure prophylaxis, AVA is recommended for unvaccinated persons after exposure to aerosolized B. anthracis spores. For this indication, it is administered subcutaneously at a one-half mil dose at zero, two, and four weeks in combination with 60 days of oral antimicrobials. This series results in rapid anti-PA antibody production and augments the antimicrobial portion of PEP. By combining vaccine and antimicrobials, the individual is protected from the germinating spores and vegetated cells of B. anthracis while their immune system is being primed and developing animistic capability. As previously mentioned, three antitoxins are approved for treatment of inhalation anthrax in combination with the antimicrobials, 
Rexabacumum, Anthem, and AIGIV. Two of the three antitoxins that are approved for treatment are also FDA approved for prophylaxis when alternatives are not available or inappropriate, Rexabacumab and Anthem. The work group is being asked to discuss a number of issues related to mass vaccination following a wide area release of B-anthracis spores. A variety of new data have become available since publication of the last set of ACIP recommendations for AVA. These include data on increased intervals between booster doses for PrEP, an alternative administration route for PEP, modeling for an adequate immune response in humans based on non-human primate studies, Additionally, there are data for a new formulation of AVA that is currently being developed in pursuit of eventual FDA licensure. We would also like the ACIP to review and advise on using an anthrax antitoxins for PEP. The ACIP anthrax vaccine work group uh, was reconvened this spring. I'll just read the terms of reference. The group is being asked to review AVA data on reduced booster schedule for pre-exposure prophylaxis to review immunogenicity, safety, and logistical considerations per, for providing AVA via intramuscular versus subcutaneous route, including specific considerations for pediatric populations, and provide evidence-based recommendations for administration as post-exposure prophylaxis. To review AVA with CPG, CPG 7909 adjuvant data and provide recommendations for post-exposure prophylaxis to review efficacy and immunogenicity data on reduced schedule and half-dose AVA use for PEP to prepare for potential emergency meeting for a mass casualty incident when AVA may become a limited resource, to review and advise on use of AVA and antitoxin for PEP when no effective antimicrobials are available or have an absolute contraindication. And here's a list of the work group members. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Are there any questions for Dr. Hendricks? Yes, Dr. Belanger. Uh, thank you. Can you just comment briefly on the current use of anthrax vaccine in uh, U.S. military? Maybe we should ask DOD to comment on that. Yeah, is DOD here? <laughs> um, good afternoon. The DOD currently uses anthrax in the prep uh, protocol for certain identified people that are considered at high risk for um, certain geographic locations, and also in certain groups that are response to C. Bernie incidents. Dr. Rangel. Just out of curiosity, where are the efficacy data going to come from? <laughs> efficacy. How will you assess efficacy? I have a hearing problem. Just it's okay. I'll answer it. Our, um, it'll be based on correlative protection. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Any further questions? Okay. We have oh, Dr. Plotkin. Well, I, I just wanted to answer the question because I, I work with Phil Brockman in, in prehistoric times, and the, the study. Uh, the efficacy study was done in workers um, receiving uh, goat hair, basically, and the efficacy was quite high, although there were not enough um, inhalation cases for statistical power, but, but it, it did appear that it worked against both cutaneous and pulmonary. I think that what you're asking, though, is the future piece, since those natural experiences won't be occurring. And I mean, the answer to that is immunological studies and also correlates of protection in animal challenge studies are what is being reviewed by the work group. Okay. Thank you very much for that very nice presentation. Um, we're going to move on to a very quick VAERS report from uh, Dr. Shima Bukhara. Hi, this presentation will serve as the announcement of the new Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System 2.0 form. So just by way of background quickly, VAERS is the National Spontaneous Reporting System for monitoring the safety of U.S. licensed vaccines. It's co-managed by CDC and FDA. 
The current VAERS form, which is called the VAERS-1 form, has been in use since 1990. The paper version of this form, which you see on the right, must be filled out by hand and mailed or faxed in, though an online reporting tool allows for web-based reporting of the VAERS-1 data. VAERS 2.0 consists of two major initiatives. One is a new VAERS form with revised data elements. We call that the VAERS 2.0 reporting form. The other is, an, is our updated processes for submitting VAERS reports. And that includes an updated online reporting tool and a writable PDF form combined with electronic document upload capability. All this incorporated into a new VAERS website. Proposed changes to the current VAERS form were first presented to ACIP NVAC and the Advisory Commission on Childhood Vaccines in September and October 2014. The proposed changes were also posted on the Federal Register for public comment in November 2014, and CDC conducted extensive user testing during the development and revision process. Changes to the VAERS form were finalized in 2016. The new VAERS 2.0 form has updated data elements, some of which include pregnancy status, race and ethnicity, and new features including writable and savable options. It also has some smart features like logic checks to present, prevent you from putting in non-logical answers. IT upgrades to the VAERS website were completed in 2017 to incorporate new data elements and into a reconfigured online reporting tool and to accommodate a new electronic document upload process. So starting June 30th, 2017, eight days from now, and extending through the end of December 2017, CDC and FDA will implement the VAERS 2.0 form and phase out the VAERS-1 form. VAERS 2.0 is for reporting by healthcare professionals, patients, parents, guardians, caregivers, and other non-manufacturer reporters. Again, reporters will be able to use the new VAERS 2.0 online reporting tool or download and complete the writable and savable VAERS 2.0 form and submit using an electronic document upload feature on the new website. Vaccine manufacturers report through a different process using the FDA electronic submission gateway. It's not advancing. Thank you. So on the left, you have a partial screenshot of a page of the VAERS reporting tool. And then on the right, you have a miniaturized version of the, the VAERS 2.0 writable, savable, and uploadable PDF. What we call essential items, these are high value data elements are highlighted in asterisks on the online reporting tool and with yellow boxes in the writable PDF form. Instructions for reporting to VAERS will be available at this URL, which will be activated June 30th. And for additional assistance, uh, folks can call uh, email uh, info at VAERS.org or call the 1-800 number. Transition to the VAERS 2.0 form is expected to be completed by the end of December 2017, and accommodations will be made for individuals unable to submit reports electronically. Thank you. Thank you very much for that update. Um, I wanted to mention that the evidence-based recommendation update has been moved to October because we got a little short on time, as everyone knows. Uh, we have no one registered for public comment right now, but we do have two quick announcements. Um, first of all, Ms. Pat Patsy Stinchfield, did you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. Um, many of you have asked about our Minnesota measles outbreak, so I thought I would um, just give you a, a quick update. Uh, so we're still in the middle of it. Uh, it started April 11th. We're up to 78 cases. Um, we at Children's Minnesota have taken care of 53 of those 78 um, with 21 admissions, mostly for dehydration and pneumonia. Thankfully, no intensive care and no deaths. Um, 71 of the 78 were completely unvaccinated. The age groups are mostly preschoolers, um, uh, between one and four year olds, um, and 83% of them are Somali Minnesotans. Um, and as you may know, there have been um, lots of activity from the anti-vaccine um, groups uh, talking with Somali families about uh, 
MMR and autism and lots of work going on in our community, including Lynn Bata, who is here today, working on communicating with uh, Somali leaders, religious leaders, et cetera, trying to break that link. Um, we had our last positive uh, rash onset um, on the 13th, so we will be out of the woods if we have no more uh, cases by the end of July. Notably, um, there's been over 8,880 exposures. And so given um, that in uh, six schools, 12 childcare and many clinics and emergency rooms, given that many exposures and thankfully a high uh, immunization rate, we um, only have had 78 cases, which uh, surpassed all of the United States 2016 cases, which was 70. We did that in seven weeks. Um, and so our, our MMR vaccine rates, particular in the Somali community, typically in Hennepin County, would be about 500 uh, Somali individuals getting vaccinated a week. Uh, and after the outbreak began, we had three straight weeks of over 3,000 MMRs delivered. So um, outbreaks do change minds, and we have seen, uh, seen that happen. So we're hoping for uh, this to come to an end, and we'll be happy to present more uh, data in October. Thank you very much for that quick update. And Dr. Middleman, I believe you had a quick announcement. Yes, I just wanted to share that the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine has published a position statement in, in the April 2017 issue of the Journal of Adolescent Health supporting the establishment of a 16-year um, old immunization platform. The platform would create an expectation among providers, parents, and patients to address immunizations that are due or overdue by age 16 years and also provides the opportunity to address other comprehensive and preventive health care needs. We also recognize with great appreciation the gray shading emphasizing this age group on the 2017 immunization schedule published by the CDC, AAP, AAFP, and ACOG. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And with that, I think we are adjourned. I hope everyone has safe travels, a great summer, and we will see you in October. Thank you.